Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. I'll be your host uh, and first speaker today. My name is Mustafa Kansas. I'm from Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp. Uh, today's title, uh, talk title, will be Amyloid Aggregates in Neurons, Life Science Applications Using Submicron Simultaneous Infrared Plus Raman Spectroscopy. Today's main speaker is Assistant Professor Oksana Klementieva. She's in neurology and the head of the medical microspectroscopy research group at Lund University in Sweden. In terms of uh, a short bio, um, she's also a leader of the amyloid group at Lund Institute of Advanced Neutron and X-ray Science. Her research uh, group focuses on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disorders. And prior to her move to Lund in 2013, she was a researcher at the Institute of Neuropathology uh, at the University of Barcelona, uh, where her research was also focused on nonlinear polymers in anti-amyloid drug candidates for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Her publications uh, in 2013 pr provided the first evidence that certain types of nonlinear polymers could be used to protect memory in Alzheimer's disease mouse models. And more recently, she began to focus on native uh, A-beta alpha beta in the brain, in the brain um, and development of ultra conservative, ultra sensitive methods for imaging of amyloid structures in neurons and brain tissue. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm Dr. Mustafa Kansas. I'm the director of product management for Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp. Uh, I'll have a much shorter bio. Uh, basically, I've been doing FTIR or some form of infrared spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy for over 20 years. Uh, and I have a PhD in biotech applications uh, of FTIR from Monash University in Melbourne. Um, and I've worked across academic research, product management and development, commercialization, sales and marketing across various applications, markets and geographies. I also want to tell you a few words about the our company, Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp, based in lovely sunny Santa Barbara, California. Uh, Photothermal Spectroscopy Corp, or PSC for short, has pioneered the breakthrough technique of optical photothermal infrared uh, spectroscopy. And this is a technique that eliminates key limitations of traditional infrared spectroscopy by providing sub-micron spatial resolution for infrared and transmission-like FTIR quality spectra for in non-contact far-field reflection mode. More recently, PSC has developed the world's first simultaneous infrared and Raman microscope and imaging system, providing IR and Raman data from the exact same spot at the same time with the same submicron spatial resolution. PSC's vision is to enable the power of IR spectroscopy to be applied to high value problems in industry and academia by the adoption of OPTIR. Throughout the webinar presentation, you will be able to type in any thoughts, comments, questions uh, into the uh, questions box on your screen. And we'll endeavor to answer those at the end. Uh, should time run out, we will then return to you via email soon thereafter. Though primarily this is a life science focused webinar, I do want to take you through a host of other application areas from polymers to organic contamination defects and microplastics. The second half will be entirely dedicated to uh, Oksana with her talk on super resolution infrared imaging of amyloid aggregates. Uh, infrared spectroscopy is basically the study of infrared light and how it interacts with matter and infrared light as a specific property in that it excites the vibrations between uh, bonds in molecules. Hence, you end up with a spectrum that's being a unique identifier to that particular material, as in the case of spectrum here on the screen being that of a particular polymer. Infrared spectroscopy has been around for a long time uh, and has been utilized in an extremely wide array of application areas, from polymers to life science, through pharma, forensics, cultural research, cultural heritage, that is, geological sciences, but still there's, there'd be many more. FTI spectroscopy instruments, FTI microscopy instruments, do have some fundamental limitations uh, just based on physics and optics. Uh, and they are an essential barrier to it being much more widely adopted or being used in multiple applications. And one of the primary limitations is that of limited spatial resolution. If you think about we as we work in the infrared, infrared wavelengths are relatively long. Right. The, the wavelengths that uh, we deal with are in the order of anywhere from as short as three, but could be a lot as long as 15 to 20 microns, and that limits your spatial resolution. On the left-hand side, we have a visible uh, image of the same optical target, uh, and that visible image is very sharp and crisp. 
That is good spatial resolution. But as we switch to the infrared, the smaller features then become blurry uh, and at, at some point impossible to, to discern. And that's just optical physics, that's, that's fundamental. Uh, one of the other primary limitations of current infrared microscopy uh, is complex sample preparation. Typically, the best quality spectra are obtained in transmission mode, but that requires the samples to be cut very thin, anywhere from maybe 5 to 20 microns. That's not always possible, depending on your sample type. It just may be something you just cannot cut, maybe something you don't want to cut. Now, ATR, uh, as an accessory, as that's attenuated total reflectance, uh, has been also around for a while and, and, real, and fairly commonly used, uh, both in, in macro and in micro mode. But it does require the ATR to be in contact with your sample. That risks damage to the actual crystal itself, which can be expensive, or to your sample. And there's also risk of cross-contamination. And perhaps the final, and maybe I think the most uh, concerning limitation is dispersive and scatter artifacts. If you take a thin film of, say, some polymer, in this case, polymethyl methacrylate, PMMA, uh, measure that as a thin film in transmission mode, you end up with an ideal spectrum. Right? That's, that's a very good looking spectrum as far as spectra are concerned. But if you take the exact same material, make that into a spherical bead, of say 15 microns, the spectra are extremely different compared to the transmission transmission measurements of a thin film. This, mind you, this is, this is the exact same material, same chemistry. Make the bead smaller and smaller again, the spectra keep changing. So it goes to show how the spectra can be affected greatly by the shape and size of what you're measuring. Uh, and, and, and this can create lots of difficulties in, in how one interprets the spectra. Now, a means to overcome all of these limitations is with a relatively new technique called optical photothermal infrared. Uh, and the instrument uh, that we call that we go call this by is, is the Mirage. The Mirage offers sub-micron infrared spectroscopy spatial resolution. Uh, it's very Raman-like in, in that sense. In fact, it's very Raman-like in many aspects, which I'll detail later. Uh, you can obtain FTIR transmission-like spectra, but we primarily operate in reflection mode. But we can also work in transmission. But even in reflection mode, the spectra that we collect are essentially the same as what you would get in transmission with an FTIR instrument. So there's no distortions, no artifacts, no interference fringes, even in reflection mode. It's non-contact, so that preserves the sample, it preserves any molecular orientation and that, but the spatial resolution rather is independent of IR wavelengths. Uh, so how does it actually work? Let me try and explain that to you. So we use a typical reflective objective. From there, we shine a tunable pulse QCL laser beam. Uh, that excites the sample. At the same time, we shine in a probe laser, a green 532. And that probe laser is measuring the reflectivity and how that reflectivity changes as a function of how you change your wavelength. So as a sample absorbs the infrared uh, laser power, its, it, its reflectivity changes uh, primarily through uh, slight surface expansion and reflective index changes as the sample heats. So again, we, we only measure, we excite in the infrared, but we measure in the visible. So this is we're using the visible light to detect the photothermal infrared effect a spatial resolution is determined or limited now only by the visible light, no longer that of the long wavelengths of the of infrared. But so far, in the next few slides, I'll attempt to make some contrasts and comparisons to the uh, types of instruments you might be more familiar with, those that have been around for a while. So if we compare how an FTIR microscope works, uh, and you know, I've, I've been doing FTIR, or I've been infrared for a long time, and I was a product manager for one of these for, uh, for probably over 10 years. How that works is you shine a, a relatively low power source, uh, a black body globar source through an interferometer. You, you move that through, you shine that through a condenser objective that goes through your sample and the light that managed to get through, so what I'm calling here the residual infrared light is collected by an objective and then passed over to your FTI detector. So what you actually measure with a classical FTIR or even one of these emerging classical QCL instruments is the residual infrared. The infrared that passes through your sample may well be reflected and scattered in, in various directions from the underside, and as it goes through it, 
but again, what you collect is what's left over after absorption, scatter, and various other optical effects. Uh, and that can cause a lot of these baseline offsets, tilts, scatter, and, uh, and other band distortions. Now, on the OPTIR side, you only record a response if the sample actually absorbs infrared radiation. So there's always going to be some reflective losses, scatter losses, and so on. In the way in which we collect and process the data, that doesn't affect uh, the OPTI measurement. It's only in an infrared absorption that generates a signal. So in that sense, you end up with a more pure infrared measurement. With the OPTI technique, you end up obtaining, as I said before, Raman-like sub-micron resolution with infrared spectral information. Uh, even though we operate in reflection or far field mode, so non-contact, uh, there are no dispersive scatter artifacts, me scattering baseline tilts and offsets and whatnot. Uh, it has a single point architecture, so there's no speckle or laser coherent artifacts, which you can get with some of these emerging QCL based systems that use two dimensional uh, FPA or focal plane array detectors. There's no need to microtome into thin slices, so in fact, we can work off thin or thick, whether it's 100 nanometers thick to several millimeters thick. In fact, maximum sample size there is about 16 millimeters. So you could measure off a 16 millimeter sample and, and obtain transmission like spectra. It's insensitive to water vapor fluctuations. So whether when you open and close the door, uh, there's no need to wait for purge stabilization. You can measure immediately. We can work on glass substrates or other visibly transparent substrates. We can collect simultaneous infrared and Raman from the same spot at the same time with the same spatial resolution. And all of these are unique only to optical photothermals with the Mirage instrument. Most labs will have an infrared microscope. They'll have some sort of infrared microscope and they'll have a Raman microscope. Uh, I'm going to use a bit of a table format here to, to, to make some of these comparisons. If the main driver for your particular experiment is spatial resolution, you'll typically go with the Raman instrument. It's typically better than traditional IR microscopes. If fluorescence is a concern in your sample, you probably won't be using Raman, you'll be using infrared. If spectral sensitivity uh, is an issue or uh, concern, typically infrared is, is more, more uh, spectrally sensitive, therefore it's typically faster. Uh, it has Infrared has far more uh, libraries, typically about you know, a factor of 10 more spectral libraries. It's, it's also more uh, spectrally interpretable and spectrally rich, typically. There are always some exceptions, of course. Uh, if you want to work in reflection mode, if you need to work in reflection mode, well, you typically won't be using your traditional IR microscope. Raman would be the instrument of choice. If water, fluctu uh, water vapor fluctuations are an issue, again, you wouldn't be using a traditional IR not for water water as well as a, as a solvent ramen would be the choice glass ramen would be your choice and if you wanted consistent spatial resolution as a function of wavelength again ramen would be your choice so if we look at the table there in terms of how the reds and greens are distributed no wonder that most labs have a ramen and a traditional ir microscope to use one or other depending on the needs of the experiment well if the opti microscope you actually do bring both of those techniques into a single platform. Uh, we have mentioned a few times now transmission-like spectral. Let me uh, give you some examples of that. So on the left-hand side, in uh, black, we've got the OPTI spectra, and in red, we've got the library spectra. You can see they basically overlap, overlap almost perfectly. Uh, we've got uh, polystyrene, PET, and PMA on, on, on the, on the right-hand side, and these are have a greater than 98% match. Uh, and mind you, these OPTIR measurements are done on thick samples, uh, whereas the library uh, match is on thin samples. Uh, spatial resolution is really a function of probe wavelength. So that's the wavelength of light you're using to measure. Uh, it's, and a function of the objective numerical aperture or property of the objective uh, you're using. Uh, and this is often referred to as the Rayleigh criteria. So basically it's 0.61 times the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture. Uh, and this is what determines or limits spatial resolution, not to be confused with pixel size, which is a separate uh, topic entirely. And if you look at existing microscopes on the market, 
uh, 0.5 as a numerical aperture would be typical. So if you're looking at a thousand wave numbers, you might expect uh, a spatial resolution of, of about 12 microns uh, at 10 microns of wavelength. Uh, but with, as the Mirage uses a probe beam that's in the visible range at 532 nanometers and uses an extremely powerful high NA objective, our spatial resolution is set to about 400, we typically say sub 500 nanometers. And the, the key, and one of the key points of differentiation here is the fact that it's consistent and flat. So again, spatial resolution is the same across the entire wavelength uh, window or the re region across which you're measuring, regardless of whether you're dealing in, in low wave number or high wave number red. So you can see how this is an exponential curve and at the high wave number, wave number end, spatial resolution gets better for traditional microscopes, which is why they'll often be quoted or images will be at these high wave number end. But you know, over here is where our, most of our information lies, it's the fingerprint region. In this fingerprint, this so-called fingerprint region, the spatial resolution is typically in the order of 10 to a little bit more uh, microns of the Mirage that is consistent and flat at, at sub 500 nanometers. Uh, as a further demonstration of this, we've taken polystyrene beads, embedded them in epoxy and sectioned them thin to about 300 nanometers. And then uh, we took a line scan across these two beads at 100 nanometer steps. So I've got about 40 spectra in here. Uh, so initially we started with epoxy. You can see the spectra changes into uh, a polystyrene spectrum and then back to epoxy as we go across these two beads. And if we plot the strongest of the polystyrene peaks as a function of position, you see a bit of a, you see a classic step function. And the width of that step function is in the order of 400 nanometers. And if you recall from our previous slide, that's pretty much exactly what you'd expect in terms of spatial resolution. Uh, here's an example of two, of a, of a thin polymer laminate film. In fact, there's a, there's a very uh, indiscernible layer in between these red and blue spots. So these are two spectra that have been collected 500 nanometers apart. Uh, and if you look at the spectra, they're spectrally very, very distinct. Uh, so really going from 500 nanometers on one side to the other side with a 500 nanometer gap, you end up with spectrally distinct spectrum. And that would be, uh, well, unthinkable in, in a traditional infrared setting. So this is a far field measurement. Uh, we introduced some new capabilities. Uh, we introduced IR plus Raman, uh, that's our ability to collect simultaneous I, uh, Raman spectra, and also introduce the ability to, to, to measure this photothermal effect in, in a transmission mode setup rather than reflection mode. So I'll, I'll take, take you through a little bit on that as well. So this has generated a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement, uh, and I call this the holy grail really of vibrational spectroscopy. Uh, if you think about it, people, as I said before, we've had different instruments We've struggled to go from one instrument to the next and maybe find the same spot. Well, here we're doing truly submicron and truly simultaneous in Fred and Raman. It's same spot, same time, same resolution. Uh, for those with, uh, with more of a perhaps instrumental technical interest, I'll quickly step you through uh, the schematics. It all starts here with the guts of it, uh, being the QCL infrared laser. Uh, that's our pump that excites a sample. So we, we send that through our reflective objective. We also send through the visible probe beam through the same objective, and that focuses onto our sample. That's where the whole photothermal magic happens. The green reflected light, or transmitted, uh, depending on any mode, uh, is, is also collected back and measures with a visible detector. Uh, and we look for uh, reflectivity differences as a function of how we sweep the uh, IR wavelengths, but at the same time, bearing in mind we're using a, a 532 laser, the Raman effect is happening whether we like it or not. In, in, as we put in this filter here to, to reflect off the Raman shifted light, we're actually just taking advantage of an effect that's happening. Uh, and that the Raman scattered light, Raman shifted light, is sent off to a Raman spectrometer. So literally it is the exact same measurement process that generates two spectra, one infrared and one Raman. So this takes full advantage of the complementarity that's been long touted and long taught between infrared and Raman, uh, but also 
I call this the two C's. It's also very, very much of a conformatory analysis as well. So the IR result confirms the Raman, and the Raman can confirm the IR, which is important in certain applications where you need to be really certain of your assignment. It means you only need one instrument. The samples are fully co-registered. Uh, and it's far more of a thorough sum of characterization. I think I said at the beginning, range of applications is, is traditional for uh, for infrared microscopy, spectroscopy. It's certainly the same with OPTIR as well. So let me take you, take you through a few of those as well. Now I'm not going to steal any of uh, Oksana's thunder here. Uh, so she, in the upcoming second half of this webinar, will be talking about her work. That was uh, recently on the on the cover of Advanced Science, and I'll point out the very impressive impact factor of 16 there as well. And she'll show how she used this technique to understand and propose some polymorphic amyloid aggregates uh, happening in neurons, um, and with some phenomenal spectral, spatial resolution. Uh, publications are on the rise, indeed they are. We just recently had a publication with uh, Kurt Marcotte, uh, and, and I saw a Noda. Uh, in, in, in the polymers fields. And of course, if you're talking about infrared and, and, and Raman, that, that, that is an ideal combination to analyze polymers. So in this case, they used infrared and Raman on the same sample across an interface and then applying some 2D correlation spectroscopy. So I've got a little bit of that data. This was a PHA PLA laminate. These are biodegradable polymers that are typically thought to be completely immiscible. Uh, and we took line scan. So this was a, a cut of the polymer film. This was not a microtime cut, so this is in fact relatively thick. Uh, so we just sliced off the top layer to end up with a flat surface, across, we've, across which we've done a line scan, a line scan at 100 nanometer intervals, steps. Uh, and these are the sort of spectra we generate. So we can see as we go from the blue, which is far more, which is a, of PHA, and as we transition into the PLA uh, substrate, the spectra change significantly. And that's also true on the Raman as well. If we dig into this a little bit further uh, and focus in on the ester carbonyl peak, uh, we see a number of sub peaks in there, and, and, and the paper goes into great length as to the origins of that and what that means about the, the, the compatibility of these two polymers. And there's some remarkable new insights that have been gained by that. Uh, I've also taken the advantage of, of being able to take single frequency images, tuning to the 1725 of the PHA and the 1760 of the PLA, doing single frequency images. You can see the, 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 the two layers very distinctly there. And if we do a, a line profile across that and plot the response of those two different uh, wavelengths, you can see that just going from air into the PHA, we end up with a very uh, sharp uh, front interface there. Move into now surface contamination. One of the other big application areas here is organic contamination uh, in high-tech products, things like uh, hard disks, electronics, glass components. Uh, and here's one on glass. So typically infrared FTI really isn't used with glass, certainly not as a substrate, neither for transmission and, and nor for reflection. Uh, but in this case, we were able to determine the the chemistry uh, and record spectra of only uh, of, of particles that are well, judging by that uh, scale bar there in the order of a micron or so or even larger. So we do see a bit of a, a, a broad uh, silicate peak coming from the glass, but it, it, in no way does it uh, completely obscure the spectrum as it would in, in a regular FTI measurement. So you can see there's some different chemistry there, and if we pick a few characteristic or distinguishing peaks and then do some single frequency images we can see where the different chemistries light up. Uh, another big application area is that in, in contamination of high-tech products. Uh, so these defects that have been circled that are barely visible in the in the, in the visible uh, generate uh, great looking infrared spectra. Uh, some of these defects are as thin as 60 nanometers. Now you'd have absolutely no chance of seeing anything like 60 nanometers on a regular FTI. You'd probably have to be at least a micron plus to get any decent uh, spectra. And a recent customer of ours has done literally thousands of these measurements and have reported better than 90% success in identifying some of these unknown, unknown organic contaminations.
here are some measurements of beads. These are uh, just 900 nanometer polystyrene beads, and these can be considered a model for particulate contamination, or consider these as a model for perhaps microplastics, and there's a lot of interest at the moment in microplastics. So we've measured on these uh, 900 nanometer beads and off. So you can see on them, you see characteristic polystyrene spectrum. If you are off uh, the bead, you end up with a flat line, just the uh, calcium chloride substrate. Of course, you end up with an excellent match to polystyrene. Another amazes me when I show this one is fiber analysis. I don't know if anyone in the audience has ever tried to measure a fiber in reflection mode of FTIR. It, it just doesn't work. It just flat out does not work. Uh, so in this case, we've got a relatively thick fiber of say 10 microns and a nanofiber of 800 nanometers. And these are the spectra. The spectra of raw, the spectra are unprocessed. There's no special maths or uh, some scattering correction because there isn't any scattering. And that's the beauty of this. Whether it's a 10 micron fiber or an 800 nanometer fiber, the spectra are reproducible, and completely characteristic. Uh, and searchable or interpretable against the existing body of uh, decades of, of infrared spectra. Uh, these are another real case. These are some additives. I believe this was a fabric softener uh, study. Um, and along the length of this fiber, uh, spectra were taken uh, and looking at the distribution of some of these additive peaks. So you can see along the length of the fiber, the additive changes. Uh, but again, what is remarkable is that where, wherever you are in the fiber, uh, the spectral quality is, is, is outstanding. Here, moving on to some polymer phase dispersions. Uh, this was a courtesy of the Max Planck Institute of uh, this Dr. Rudiger Berger. Uh, so if we zoom in, in in the visible image, we can see a polymer system. This is the PLA-ACM uh, system with clearly uh, phase dispersion going on. If we collect some images at some characteristic frequencies, we see, not surprisingly, a nice a high contrast image. Uh, and if we, and that was collected at 500 nanometers. And if we collect that at 100 nanometer steps, we can see the spatial resolution is greatly enhanced. In fact, then we can go in there and also look at single point spectra from different regions, both on the hotspot and off the hotspot. And we see characteristics spectra from those two different components. Um, if we move on to, well, it's the same system, but actually looking at the spatial resolution a little bit further, if I zoom into some of these areas, these little spots here are 154 nanometers. So really, we're actually seeing infrared contrast in these images well below the, 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 the expected diffraction of it. So that's 152, 154 nanometers. That's pretty impressive. So I'm jumping back to now a life science measurement. Uh, this is something that I did one late night. These are cheek cells, uh, epithelial cheek cells collected from my very own cheek uh, and put onto a calcium fluoride slide with a drop of water and another calcium fluoride cover slip on top. So here I'm measuring cheek cells biological cells as, as a model in water. Right. Uh, and this is relatively thick. So this was no space in there. So it was a drop of water with a with the cover slip placed on top with a little bit of pressure from my finger. And then I, I randomly clicked some spectra. I, I got these sort of looking spectra. I saw quickly that there were some characteristic peaks. So I settled on doing a three wave number image to hone in on those three uh, macromolecules of lipid, protein, and nucleic acids. Uh, and that image there well, looks like a, a fluorescence image. These lipid inclusions are something like a sub one micron. Mind you, this is also done with 500 nanometer steps as well. And I, if, if I were to redo this at 100 nanometers, I've no doubt that image would look much, much better. Uh, here's an example from a group that we've been working with from the uh, University of Exeter, Professor Nick Stone and his postdoc, Kriprika Nala, and it is in, in publication as we speak. These were breast tissue calcifications that they had measured on their existing FTIR imaging system uh, and, and wanted to see what, um, what else they could see with this high resolution system. So we started off randomly clicking around 
uh, this particular sample in this particular region, in fact, where breast calcification was thought to exist in high quantities based on the uh, TIR images. And as we clicked around, well, the, the spectra that we were getting out, most of what we were getting out, did not show the level of calcification, calcification that they expected. So we thought, all right, well, let's just do some images. Let's do a calcification image, which would, which would be a 1050, and a protein image at, say, 1550. And, and then, wow, uh, at this point, we were astonished at the fact that the calcifications appear to be extremely heterogeneous, but also on a very small scale. Uh, and this really makes sense because if you think about the resolution, the spatial resolution of, of an FTIR system, it just won't have the resolution for, for to be able to resolve this level of heterogeneity. So you end up smoothing this out, smearing this all out such that calcification almost appears everywhere. But with the uh, ultra high super resolution technique that this is, you can actually then start to get uh, a more realistic understanding of what's happening with the system. All right, so here are some of the spectra. Uh, so in between these hotspots, you end up with sort of regular protein looking spectra. There's also a fair bit of uh, beta structure based on the shape of the amide one there. But if we're on the hotspots, we we'll see whopping great uh, calcification uh, peaks. Right, if we um, take a ruler out and, and measure these with the software uh, ruler, we see measurements or, or particle sizes of 1.6 to maybe uh, six microns, or, or and in some cases less. If I recollect this at 100 nanometers and not 500 what was a bit of a smear over here ends up being clear differentiation. And some of these features are about 283 nanometers in size. So even though we're using effectively or pumping and exciting with 10 microns of light, we're measuring sort of just under 300 nanometers of spatial resolution. Again, that's something pretty remarkable. Uh, this is just an example of how one might overlay the two images and, and use some particle analysis software, maybe with some extra metrics on your sample. Um, on the theme, back to the theme of publications on the rise, microplastics. Uh, recently, we were featured in a review uh, of microplastics, a global perspectives on microplastics, and this was a preliminary study just to look at uh, how one could use infrared uh, and Raman at the same time from the same spot as, as a means to better characterize your particles, because if anyone in the audience is familiar with microplastics, there are those who swear uh, that, that infrared is the best, and there are those who say no, RAM is the best. And I like to think of this technique as bringing those two camps together to better characterize your sample. All right, so we've done some preliminary model uh, work on, on microplastics as well. So we've used microspheres as, as our models. In this case, these were polystyrene, uh, 900 nanometers, two microns, four and a half and 10 microns of polystyrene together with some PMMA, three micron beads as well. As if that wasn't a, a difficult enough challenge, we thought, well, why don't we actually suspend this in salt water and dry, and dry it out? So now you end up with a mixture of uh, salt crystals, uh, which for a normal FTI would just absolutely scatter like crazy and render any measurements uh, useless. Uh, so we've got salt crystals and uh, beads together. So in this zoomed in optical image, we've got uh, some salt crystals, uh, and in amongst the salt crystals, we've got uh, your various polymer beads. And you can see your PMMA beads, a range of sizes, the spectra all look the same. Uh, well, the PMMA is the one size, but your polystyrene comes in in a range of sizes, and again, they all look the same. And in this case, since we know what's there, we can actually tune to those particular uh, wavelengths, wave numbers, uh, and, and collect images and see how the image lights up. So this is another example of how the spectra are consistent regardless of the particle shape or size. And that is a property that is absolutely unique to this instrument, this technique. Uh, and and in, in a regular FTIR or a Q cell based system, the spectra are going to be highly dependent on particle shape and size. Uh, so here's an example of some Raman and IR on the, on the, on the very same particles. And if you now use uh, some software from Know It All that allow, allows you to simultaneously uh, search both infrared and Raman, you can actually plot your Raman heat quality index and IR heat quality index in the same plot. Uh, and obviously the upper right hand corner, which is the high Raman HQI and the high IR HQI is the right one.
it's just coming to the end of my part, I'm about to hand over to Roxana. I just want to leave you with some take uh, take home or takeaway messages. Uh, OPTIR takes microscopy beyond anything known and traditional and accepted, uh, and essentially brings the best of ion and RAM into a single platform. We offer sub-micron resolution. It's non-contact, works in reflection mode. We have eliminated any dispersive the scatter artifacts. There's little to no sample preparation as well. And with IR Raman, we bring sub-micron simultaneous measurements. It's the same spot, same time, same resolution. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Oksana. Hi, my name is Oksana Klementieva. I'm Assistant Professor in Neurobiology at Medical Faculty of Lund University. And here I would love to share my experience how I use super-resolution infrared to image amyloid proteins directly in neurons. So during this lecture, I will talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease, why new approaches necessary, and why I have used super-resolution infrared imaging. Also, I will present two papers which were published in 2017 and uh, 2020. So, Alzheimer's disease. In the brain of uh, Alzheimer's disease pr patients, there is atrophy of brain, of uh, brain tissue. So, here you could see the slice taken from the brain of Alzheimer's disease patient comparing to the to the healthy individual. And in this tissue of Alzheimer's disease patient, we could find amyloid plaques. And those amyloid plaques, those amyloid plaques are made from amyloid fibrils. And uh, those amyloid fibrils made of uh, amyloid protein. What is interesting, amyloid protein aggregates and form beta sheet rich structures. And those beta sheet structures can be detected by infrared spectroscopy. So, however, it is um, so still it is not known why amyloid protein begin to aggregate, forming those amyloid structures. So, to answer this question, many techniques are used to understand Alzheimer's disease molecular mechanism. For example, uh, histochemistry or uh, immunohistochemistry or electron microscopy. Using those techniques, we can detect amyloid proteins specifically in every single single cellular compartment. However, those techniques cannot be used to study the structure of amyloid protein. So, to study structure of amyloid proteins and change of amylo structure of amyloid proteins, I use infrared spectroscopy. And I use model of Alzheimer's disease. This is transgenic mouse model for Alzheimer's disease. This transgenic mouse has a human amyloid precursor protein gene and express amyloid beta. Those amyloid beta aggregates and uh, AD transgenic mouse has amyloid plaques and problems with memory. As a negative control, I use mouse which completely lacks amyloid precursor protein and therefore has no amyloid protein in brain tissue. As a healthy control, I use wild type mice which produce amyloid protein, but this is mouse amyloid protein, and those mice do not develop Alzheimer's disease. So here, how looks like the brain of a mouse. This is a tiny organ of about one centimeter uh, size, but it's already very complex. And here you could see how many neurons in, in, this, in the cube of 200 microns. So, to overcome this complexity, we grow neurons on slight support. So, we seed neurons, we take neurons from mouse brain, we seed them on the slight support. Those neurons grow for 20 or 30 days on the slide, and then we fix them. After that, those neurons can be used for infrared spectroscopy. In our study published in 2017, we were able to show that protein aggregation begins in neurons. And what is interesting, this aggregation comes with age. So we demonstrate in this study 
that in wild type neurons and in young transgenic neurons, protein aggregation is at the physiological level. However, if those neurons, uh, if transgenic neurons left to age in the culture, we see increase of beta sheet structures. So to conclude, uh, in, in the study, we showed that beta sheet aggregation can be detected in brain tissue. What is interesting, we were able to detect beta aggregation before it was possible to detect using specific antibodies. Also, we detected beta sheet formation in primary neurons taken from transgenic mouse. However, spatial resolution of uh, micro FTR was not enough to image chemical structures at subcellular level. So we, can, we conclude that we need super resolution approach to image beta sheet structures directly in neurons. Here on the image, you could see fluorescently labeled neurons. This is cell body and this is dendrite. Uh, on the dendrite, we could see small protrusions. They called spines. And actually those spines is important for memory. So actually, this is where our memory is stored. So if we enlarge the image, we could see them here better. So those protrusions of one micrometer size, therefore we need infrared approach, which allowed to look at chemical structure below one micron. Infrared imaging were done at Soleil Synchrotron Smith beam line. The beam line has excellent possibility to move from micro to nano measurements. And we use Mirage, which is installed uh, at Smith beam line. So this is the principle how Mirage works. And I hope you remember from the previous explanation, just to remind that using a visible light infrared light was focused and that gives a possibility to image below uh, one micrometer. So this is my sample. This is neuron which grows on the sample support and the dots indicate the spectra where the, we acquired them. So we here the steps is below one micrometer and below is infrared image to show how neuron looks at the wavelengths of amida one so we took the spectra and here the spectra are plotted and we could see the quality of the spectra so then we plotted the um, the intensity of uh, phototermal amplitude of the spectra and we could distinguish the spectra which were taken from the cell body and from neurites so this part Next, we treated neurons with synthetic amyloid beta. This peptide easily forms beta sheet, and we used it as a positive control to be sure that we can detect beta sheet structures at 16, 13 nanometers. So we did two, Im two infrared images at 16, 30 and 16, 50 reverse centimeters. <clears throat> so you, I show the zoom of most interesting part, which I will talk further. So in this image, the scale bar is two micron. We could see the ratio image. So this 1630 was divided by 1650. And we could see as the red dots elevation of beta sheet structures. So the red spectra taken from red dots and the green spectra taken from the green green space. So and we could see that those clear spectra are clearly different, showing the shift which corresponds to beta sheet structures. So here, this is how it looks like a neuron and the scale bar approximately 50, 50 microns. So here we zoom, here we look on the neuronal surface and this is the zoom image. Five, the dimension is five micrometer by five micrometer. So, and then using the same approach, we took the spectra at two different wave numbers and look at the, uh, their ratio. And here we could see not only 
Here we could see the, the elevation of beta sheet structures and the distance between two uh, spectra, which is below 500 nanometer. We could see it also the, we could see also difference in the spectrum. So next, uh, our aim was to zoom to these pro membrane protrusions, spines, and to look chemical structure in those spines. So, so we were zooming to this small protrusion, and this is the image. The dimension is five by five uh, microns, and we could see we could see that if we take spectra from dendritic part, this is the black one, and we could take spectra of good quality from the spine of uh, of neuron. So this is spectra from the spine is red. And then we were studying number of spines at transgenic and um, and wild type animals. And then we compare. And here we could see average of spectra taken from wild type in, uh, animals compared to transgenic animals. And what we could see, we could see increase of, uh, we could see the shift of the spectra at the wave number 1640 and the increase of lipid oxidation at the wave number 7037. So if we plot those data, we could see first increase of beta sheet structures and increase of lipid oxidation in lipid in, in transgenic animals. So we conclude that we uh, we can detect beta sheet structures in the spines, and also we could observe some lipid oxidation in the same spines. So next, the step next our step was to study protein structure along the dendrites. So here it is the dendrite, and this is the fragment of the dendrite. So what we observe. Again, we observe the difference between wild type animals and transgenic animals. And we could observe the in increase of beta sheet structures along the dendrite. If we compare the spectra taken from spines and from the dendrite, we could see the difference that, and we could conclude that there is some structural polymorphism in amyloid aggregates, which can be in spines and which can be in dendrites. To sum up, I would love to stress that with novel, label-free and very sensitive optical form for the thermal infrared microspectroscopy, we could image amyloid structure directly in neurons at submicron resolution. Also, I would love to I stress that amyloid beta aggregates are present already in transgenic neurons and they are structurally distinct. Is it structure function? Is it structure function relation? We should to study it further. And, uh, and maybe po polymorphism of amyloid beta aggregates can be uh, can explain the polymorphism of, of Alzheimer's disease. So with that, I would love to thank all my collaborators at Lund University, Professor Gunnar Gurus, at Saleh Bimlein Ferenc Brodnich and Christoph Sand, and Musa, Mustafa Kanzis from Spe Photothermal Spectroscopy Group. And of course, I thank you for, all, for your attention and I will be happy to take your questions. Great. Thank you, Oksana, for that thoroughly uh, informative uh, talk. I've certainly learned a lot about uh, these neurons. Um, and I can see a few questions having come in already. So uh, let me read those out to you. Okay, so uh, the one of the questions I have here is, how would you contrast this with something like Raman microscopy, which has similar spatial resolution? Um, infrared microscopy uh, used to study protein structure, and this is a very powerful technique which gives information about uh, 
proteins. Raman spectroscopy is not that sensitive in terms of study protein structure. However, I believe that co-use of this technique can be very helpful. For example, we observed that increase of beta sheet structures correlate with increase of uh, lipid oxidation. And here, Raman can be used to study uh, lipid uh, lipids in the same structure simultaneously with protein structure. Okay, uh, I'll move on to the uh, next question. Uh, what was the area that each spectrum was measured from? We believe that we were uh, about 500 nanometer spot size. Okay, uh, the next one is, uh, can you say something about the sample preparation, please? So the, spectros the spectroscopic measurements we did, they were on at room temperature and in air. So neurons cannot live in those conditions. Therefore, we have to fix them. So um, the procedure is following. We take neurons from mouse embryo and we seed those neurons on the cells, on, on the sample support. These neurons then grow, continue growing for 20 or 30 days in the culture. And then when we age them according to the project, we fix them with paraformaldehyde. Then the samples are dried and ready for spectroscopy. Okay, and um, this may be the last question we have in, in, in the um, respect of time. Uh, how long do these spectra take? Uh, and how, how long do the images take as well, they ask? So the time of the spectra acquisition really depends on the thickness of the sample. For example, we could get we could get uh, very good spectra from a cell body in, in less than one second with one spectra. Uh, however, when imaging more thin uh, neurites, we need more spectral, um, uh, more spe acquisition time and more averaging so but um, but it and it of course depends how big the area of imaging but it is quite fast technique and allows to scan big area and then zoom to the zone of interest with more um, with more time Okay, thank you, Oksana. Um, the remaining questions, uh, I think it would be best answered remotely in the interests of time. I thank you and appreciate your uh, time and effort here, Oksana. Uh, and also, I thank all of our attendees for taking the time out of, out of their busy day to listen in. And hopefully, uh, they've uh, learned something. Uh, and we are always here to answer further questions via email. Uh, and this has been recorded, and we will be sending that link out to all attendees so they can pass on to uh, your friends and colleagues. So uh, wishing you a good day and thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.